Thanks. Thank you, everyone, for coming to the second presentation of the AIA Monterey Bay's Arts and Architecture Lecture Series for 2022. Um, this year, it is shaping the future, land use from the global perspective to local implementation. I'm Eric Dyer, past president of AIA Monterey Bay. And tonight, I want to especially thank Tim Allen Properties for helping support this event. And we have Billy and his wife, Rachel, here from Tim's office. Thank you very much for supporting us. And I also want to thank Cheeseboro Wine for the wine that we've had for this series. It's really delicious. And I'd like to thank Shermaine Jones, our executive director, without which none of this would happen. And I'd also like to thank Hidden Valley Music Seminars and Peter Meckel, I don't know if he's here, but for providing this wonderful space. And now I'd like to introduce the moderator, moderator for tonight's panel discussion. She is past president of AIA Monterey Bay. And after a long hiatus, it was she who reestablished the Arts and Architecture Lecture Series back in 2019. This year, she has taken charge of the series again and programmed these three timely presentations. And for a day job, she is founder and principal architect for the exceptional award-winning and internationally published firm, Studio Shikatans. Marianne Chickatetz. Thank you, and welcome, everybody. Uh, welcome to our esteemed panel of um, land use specialists tonight. And I want to introduce each one of you by name, and please say just a couple words uh, about yourself and where, who you represent. We'll start with ladies first. Jean Twitile, Luis. Hey, thank you. Everyone can hear me okay, right? <laughs> yes. Uh, so I'm uh, Jeanette Twitile Lewis, and I've been uh, serving as the president and CEO for Big Sur Land Trust since 2014. Prior to that, um, I served as the executive director for uh, the Sierra Fundo Conservancy, which worked in Fresno, Madera, Mariposa and Eastern Merced County, so really the land between Yosemite Kings Canyon National Parks doing conservation work there. So. Great. Mike. Um, Mike DeLapa. I'm the Executive Director of Land Watch Monterey County, which I have been doing since 2016. I started Land Watch in 1997 with my wife, uh, Dr. Rebecca Shaw and Bradley Zeev, and We've been uh, focusing on land use for 25 years now. Prior to um, this job, I worked uh, in the Bay Area running the California Ocean Science Trust uh, at Environmental Defense Fund and at three different startups. Thank you. Matthew Sunt. Okay, my name is Matthew Sunt, and uh, I've been in the planning profession for many, many years. Uh, my geographic extent goes up to Yuba City, to Bass Lake, to Pismo Beach. I've written a variety of environmental impact reports. I represent public agencies as adjunct staff, and that would be such uh, agencies as LAFCO, Monterey Peninsula Water Management District, Monterey Peninsula Regional Park District, um, contract work for Monterey County and San Juan Batista, et cetera, et cetera, ad nauseum. And I'd like to point out that I'm the only one who's not crossing his leg. You're the tallest. <laughs> and last not least, Tony. That's because I don't want to get kicked in the, you know what? <laughs> Tony Lombardo, I've been practicing land use law here in Central Coast since 1982. Thank you. So I would like to start like we started last time with just presenting a, a little bit of a base data of where we just, uh, basic data of where we start when we look at land use. So last time we just looked at the whole world, at the, at the globe, and um, saw, you know, that 70% are oceans, 30% is land. So this is the land we're looking at. And then we broke it down into, you know, how much of that is habitable land, about 70%, and how is the habitable land again used? Um, uh, an astonishing 50% for agriculture, and then what is forest, shrubs, fresh water, and how much of it is urban and built up land. 
And um, interestingly enough, how much of that agricultural land is actually used for livestock and how much for growing food for people. So that um, is the global statistic. <clears throat> when we look at the United States, this is a map that is color coded for pasture and ranch land, forests, cropland, special use and miscellaneous, and urban land. <clears throat> and then we broke that apart. So um, you, when you put it all together, you get a graphic representation of sort of the percentages, uh, while um, only you know, a small part really seems developed land, that is that pink uh, area, but what is auxiliary to it um, is, is the special use and the miscellaneous area. So as such, it takes up about 20% of the total uh, uh, square miles in the United States. <clears throat> then uh, we just broke it apart. Here we go. So these are um, all the developed areas, which actually doesn't look like that much when you look at that. So only 3.6% of the total states of United States are developed. But um, most of, uh, of the people in the, in the country live in those areas. However, when you add the miscellaneous and auxiliary uh, uses, <clears throat> which are roads, airports, bridges, cemeteries, you know, all of that, you see how fragmented actually the open land is. Um, and then here would then be a graphic representation of the agricultural land and uh, pastures and forests. And now we get to California. So California is very, um, very similar. <clears throat> and this now is, um, you see how much of it again is agriculture for cropland, pasture, and ranch land. Um, then you see represented the forests, other rural areas, 6.2% approximately developed areas and also how much is owned by the federal government, which uh, that's a very interesting history, why so much of the Western United States is still owned by the federal government. <clears throat> and another uh, different graphic representation of um, California and which public entities now uh, own certain parts of what is public land. And with that, I would like to lead straight into how did land use in California develop? And Matthew, I will give the word to you to give us a brief history on that. Okay. So um, a couple, three months ago, I get the invite to present. Marianne says, uh, how about something on the subject of the history of the state of California? So I'm scratching my head. How do I consolidate and make this as succinct as possible? So I started off, my pivot point was... Uh, a book recently released by um, uh, John Aliotti Jr. from San Francisco, whose dad was the mayor of San Francisco. Anyway, he wrote a book about the uh, city of San Francisco, previously known as Yerba Buena, and uh, the history of San Francisco up to 1848, when the population exploded as a result of the gold rush. <clears throat> anyway, I use that as my pivot point, so I kind of run off of that, and then I go into other uh, areas of discussion. So the history of land use in California starts with international competition to acquire land in the state. Spain, Russia, France, Britain, United States, as it was back in those, day, in those days, um, and I'll throw in Argentina as well, because Argentina did plant a flag in Monterey at one point, albeit for only six days, I believe. Um, and keep in mind, back in the late 1700s, first half of the 1800s, uh, travel by sea was a big deal. Uh, once you got to California, you got the rivers to take advantage, uh, to take advantage of, the Klamath, uh, the Sacramento, San Joaquin rivers. Um, and of course, by land, uh, by land meaning you're going to be in a Conestoga wagon, you're going to be walking, you'll be on a horse, what, et cetera. <clears throat> and keep in mind that uh, land competition and the uh, international community uh, wanting to acquire and take over this, the area of, that is now California, the Russians came in from the north, and the Spaniards came in from the south, and eventually uh, the Argentinians and the French and the United States, uh, whatnot, came in from the south as well by uh, uh, sea vessels. <clears throat> and then you also know that city of Monterey was a, a port of entry for all related, uh, all taxable, for all taxable goods in California during the Spanish period. 
uh, hides and pelts foremost with various lumber and timber extracted and transported along coast and inland for construction. Uh, keep in mind as well, early days of the state of California or um, Alta California, uh, you have Yerba Buena, which became San Francisco. That's uh, in a cove, um, built on a cove. Uh, the uh, uh, Richardson Bay in the city of Sausalito, uh, city of Monterey on the Monterey Bay. Um, and when we talk about uh, by land, of course, the Spaniards and the Mexicans coming in from the south, predominantly in the early years, uh, late 1700s, early 1800s, then the Europeans coming in from the east across the continent via the various uh, passes, Donner Pass, Carson Pass, Ebbets Pass, etc. Uh, the first Europeans to enter from the east were mostly trappers and government surveyors, such as Gov uh, Captain Fremont, and his soldiers. Uh, of course, um, we're talking wagons pulled by mules, horses, Conestoga wagons, and at some point uh, later, we'll have the uh, Intercontinental Railroad. Um, Significant milestones in California land use, as I see it, uh, 1830s, the secularization of the Spanish mission properties, followed by 1848, the California gold rush. Uh, I think you probably all know that uh, Yerba Buena, which became San Francisco, had something like 500 to 1,000 residents up until 1848, and then after that it just exploded to 25,000 in 1849, 35,000 in 1850, up by 1880, there were 234,000 people in San Francisco. Meanwhile, at that same period of time, LA had 1,600 residents in 1850 and 55,000 residents in 1890. <clears throat> and keep in mind that sailing to the West Coast, sailing to San Francisco, took about six months, or you could go from St. Louis to San Francisco via overland route, and that would take you about six months as well. Uh, in inclement weather, maybe up to a year. And another major event, significant milestone in California land use history is 1869, the Transcontinental Railroad. Uh, no more Conestogas, not a good time to be a wheelwright. Uh, the rail brought in a huge influx of people from the East Coast. Um, and then we jump forward to 1872 and 1903. And this is another point, I, another pivot point. The big shift to, converse, to conservation, as I call it, the big shift to conservation, part one. 1872, uh, Ulysses S. Grant uh, creates Yellowstone National Park, uh, the first national park in the United States, if not the first national park in the world. And then <clears throat> jump forward to 1903, the camping trip that changed a nation, and that's John Muir and and um, uh, Teddy Roosevelt. Muir was noted for being an ecological thinker, political spokesman, and religious prophet whose writings became a personal guide into nature for many people. John Muir went on a three-day escapade through Yosemite Valley in 1903 with then-President T.R. <clears throat> this event became the cornerstone of our great national park system. That includes Yosemite, Kings Canyon, etc. The Muir philosophy also sparked the modern-day environmental movement. <clears throat> Following the Muir and Roosevelt trip in 1903, not only did Roosevelt resolve to protect Yosemite, he would go on to sign into existence five more national parks, 18 national monuments, Pinnacles National Monument being one of them, 55 national bird sanctuaries and wildlife refugees, and 150 national forests. So it was a big deal. It, it kind of changed the frame of mind for a lot of people. Um, where they see the environment that they're taking advantage of, that they're uh, being successful in, but they also see changes uh, that bother them. And, and there's John Muir being one of my personal heroes, uh, really did an outstanding job of getting, getting the wheels in motion as far as the uh, environmental movement goes. Uh, 1920, <clears throat> US Route 66. Uh, equal to, in my opinion, equal to the, into the um, interstate highway system and the, and the uh, Intercontinental Railroad. Uh, now, Route 66, think about the Depression era Dust Bowl and Steinbeck's book, The Angry Raisins, also called The Grapes of Wrath. As a result of Route 66, Los Angeles population exploded to 570, half a million people in 1920 from the population of 300,000 approximately in 1910. 
And by 1930, L.A. area and L.A. proper had a million and a quarter people in it. And in large part because of Route 66. But of course, we also had uh, better sailing ships or better ships that brought more people around the, uh, uh, through the Panama Canal. <clears throat> so uh, keep in mind as well, L.A. was ranked 10th largest city in 1920, 5th largest city in 1930, and now is second to uh, New York. So the point being that World War II, up to World War II, the inflow of population in California was huge, and then World War II was also a cause for a big population influx. In 1956, the interstate highway system. So you can see that the intercontinental and the interstate highway system and uh, bigger and faster ships, and you have a vastly improved transportation system that brings goods, services, and people to and fro. So here's conservation part two. Conservation part one was Yellowstone and John Muir and Teddy Roosevelt. Conservation part two, as I see it, go to 1961. Save the Bay is an organization founded, is founded leading to the San Francisco Bay Conserv Conservation and Development Commission, the BCDC, that was in 1965. Three women who created the Save the Bay organization in 1961 convinced the state of California to create that Bay Conservation Organization. <clears throat> they were Kay Kerr, Sylvia McLaughlin, and Esther Gullick, all UC Berkeley faculty wives. Kay Kerr was the wife of UC President Clark Kerr. These powerful and eloquent women did not like what they saw as they gazed out the windows of their East Bay hillside homes and they decide they're going to do something about it. <clears throat> now keep in mind, the original San Francisco Bay, and there are actually eight bays in San Francisco Bay, was estimated to be approximately 789 square miles. One plan promoted by the U.S. Department of Commerce in the late 1950s, looking forward 75 years, would have shrunk it down to 225 square miles. So uh, those three ladies really did a wonderful job in creating a... Um, a a change in the Bay Area, and it spreads out. The idea of conservation spreads out. <clears throat> and then, jump forward to 1970, National Environmental Policy Act, as well as the California Environmental, Environmental Quality Act, to create and maintain conditions under which man and nature can exist in productive harmony to fulfill the social and economic requirements of present and future generations. In 2008, Governor Schwarzenegger enacted SB 375, brings together land use and transportation planning to reduce greenhouse emissions related to vehicles. The law requires that metropolitan planning organizations incorporate a sustainable community strategy within their regional transportation plan. Then 2017, we have accessory dwelling units, which is a pretty big deal for a lot of people. And it certainly helps with our uh, increasing our housing stock, which is deficient by uh, a few million. Uh, in 2021, we get SB 9, became effective in 2022, and mandates local jurisdictions to ministerially approve two types of projects. <clears throat> if specific objective criteria are met, those projects are a subdivision of one lot into two resultant lots in a single family residential zone, and number two, a second dwelling unit in a single family residential zone. So ADUs, accessory dwelling units, uh, came into being in 2017, and it's morphed a few times since 2017, and then 2021 is SB 9, and then SB 10 authorizes local agencies to pass an ordinance to zone any parcel for up to 10 units of residential density if the parcel is located in a transit-rich area, which includes areas near rail transit or bus routes with peak headways of 15 minutes or faster, or an urban infill site. So in closing, very quickly, uh, massive population increase over the years. Uh, we're, in a, we're in a quagmire as far as the housing supply goes. We, we can't seem to be getting the housing supply up. Uh, our transportation system, I think, is a two-legged stool, as it, and it should be a three-legged stool, and that third leg would be high-speed rail. And then lastly, uh, we need more roundabouts. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Um, Tony, to... Uh, 
ask you, so when, we heard a lot about conservation now and public land development, but uh, and also about this big influx of people that came in on per in various periods. How did how was their order established basically on the private property funds? So when you have all these massive people come through Gold Rush, for example. Who and how did we get to the place that we actually know who owns what and who regulates what? Uh, I haven't found any order actually in the system yet, but no, in all seriousness, um, traditional government involvement in the use of property was more or less limited to nuisance, the theory of nuisance. In other words, everybody could do whatever they wanted on their property until you know, you had a tallow works that was stinking up the neighborhood and somebody from the government would show up and say, you can't do that anymore. So 1927, the U.S. Supreme Court decides the case of Euclid, City of Euclid versus Ambler Park Real Estate in Pennsylvania and says, government has the legitimate police power to regulate land use within their boundaries so you can say, this is where people can live, this is where businesses live, this is where industry lives. That was the first real uh, legal recognition of the use of the police power from the, Cal from the United States Constitution, also found in the California Constitution, to regulate what people could do with their property. Monterey County, interestingly enough, was a fairly early devotee of that theory because when Highway 1 was constructed in the 1930s, I can't remember exactly, early 30s, I guess, I don't know, whatever it was, the uh, county enacted an ordinance prohibiting the construction of billboards on Highway 1. So uh, Monterey County was fairly early into the party when it came to certain things and other things not so early. Uh, for example, in Carmel Valley, where we, a lot of us live, I don't, I live in Carmel, but in Carmel Valley, the county didn't require a building permit until the 1960s. You just build whatever you wanted and it didn't, didn't matter. So, uh, as Matthew said, there's the regulatory framework then, of course, grew from there. Uh, my experience has been that government never shrinks, it only grows. And as he mentioned, uh, the United States enacted the National Environmental Policy Act, or NEPA, interestingly enough, in the Nixon administration, uh, to require environmental analysis for government actions rather than just doing them, which probably means that there would be no Grand Coulee Dam or <laughs> Golden Gate Bridge now if, that, if they were proposed today because of those laws. And California followed suit within the same year and adopted the California Environmental Quality Act, which later was applied to both private and both private and public actions. Uh, that was under the Reagan administration in the, in the state of California. So when everybody complains about the Democrats, you can blame the Republicans equally for the regulations we have. So uh, after the enaction, uh, enactment of those regulations and with the power of zoning uh, and land use control, uh, the development of land then became very strictly regulated and particularly in California, different places in the country have different until relatively recently. For example, the city of Houston, Texas, had no zoning. You could build an office tower right next to somebody's house, and there was, there was, was absolutely no, no limitation uh, on it uh, imposed by the government of the city of Houston. Obviously, they rethought that at some point and decided some regulation would be worthwhile. So. Uh, Framework, statutory framework developed requiring the preparation of what's called general plans and then zoning to implement them. Uh, up until Richard, I can't remember, it was by the time you practiced, it was certainly by the time I practiced, that the law was passed uh, in the state of California making general plans mandatory and the consistency with the zoning's consistency with general plans mandatory. So at that point, uh, with the California Environmental Quality Act, with the requirement of a general plan and zoning to determine what uses were appropriate in what areas, and then the ability to challenge that determination uh, starting in the mid to late 1960s uh, and 
and continuing up through today, the regulations have just become more and more intense and limiting the um, ability to use land or to develop land, which isn't necessarily a bad thing everywhere, but uh, it makes it more difficult and more expensive to uh, use your property. I, I visited a, a new client last week who had to obtain a permit from the county to do a drainage improvement because the street drainage was flooding their property and the county made them get a permit to put in a culvert through their property. The culvert costs $13,000 to install. The permit costs $63,000 to obtain. So, um, and you don't have to look very hard to wonder why housing costs so much. Uh, so, uh, through that regulatory framework, it has now become extremely difficult and extremely expensive uh, to use property, and they're very limited. I think the statistic Mike may know better than I do, but I think in Monterey County, is it 3% of the land that's dedicated to urban use, I believe? Yeah, I could be off, but it's, it's similar to the statistic you showed. It, it's relatively uh, few. That doesn't mean it's still a, there still aren't issues. I mean, all you have to do is drive on Highway 68 or Highway 1, <laughs> PM and AM peak, that know there's some planning issues that need to be taken care of in terms of transit. Uh, and, you know, we live in a constant state of water poverty uh, in the county. Uh, some, of our, some of God's creation and some of our own creation, but uh, those issues aren't going away anytime soon. So the, the, the government, more or less, has complete control now over what someone does with their property, subject to the outer limits of constitutional uh, forbearance, which happened to the famous cases that we, some of us are very familiar with, of course, are like Nolan and Dolan, where the Supreme Court said, no, you can't make someone give the public the right to walk across their property in return for building a house on a legal lot of record. Uh, that doesn't mean they can't make you give a trail if you want to subdivide your property uh, because uh, after 1973, the state of California enlarged its authority over regulation of subdivisions dramatically, uh, which is why we have parks dedications and affordable housing requirements and all the things that go along with making subdivisions more expensive. So the, we're, in a, we're in a world now where the legal framework uh, is extremely complicated. If anyone has ever tried to apply for anything anywhere, they can appreciate uh, the difficulty uh, involved in obtaining entitlements. And there are always you know, people who have a reason not to want to see those things happen because they live next door, because they enjoy the quality of life they have now and don't want it to change, or they're concerned about environmental impacts that result from additional development, uh, or the availability of infrastructure and resources. So there's a now, there, the, the law has provided an absolutely perfect forum for those concerns to be expressed. Some, including the abuses of situations where, you know, I don't want my view, I have a nice view of the ocean, I don't want it to change by you building your two-story house on your lot because I haven't, no one's, I had, I had a project in the City of Carmel Planning Commission one time and every neighbor spoke against it all the way around it and the chairman eventually said, you know, I don't think you people want a house at all built here. You should just buy the lot from this person, <laughs> then you won't have that problem. You can yeah. just keep it open. So, um, but it's, 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 you know, the, I don't know, the first EIR I think I ever looked at was this big. Mm -hmm. The last one, and that was for a 500 home subdivision. Yeah. The last one I looked at for 150 <laughs> home subdivision was this big. Yeah. So the, uh, I guess good for lawyers, bad for a lot of other people, but it's, uh, it's become an extremely complex, extremely Byzantine and difficult process to do anything in, including even building a lot, a single family dwelling on an existing yeah. lot of records. 
I'm very familiar with that problem. <laughs> so I, when we look at the map, there's so much uh, federal land, and I do have one follow-up question. In preparing for this lecture, I, I learned so much myself about the develop, land development in the Western st or in the United States. You know, so that the federal government basically took it away from the Indians and, and it was declared it theirs. But then I think the original intention was to then kind of parcel it out or let people homestead it. And at some point that changed. Since we have so much federal land, is that set in stone or what happened? At which point uh, did the homesteading stop? At the, at, at the end of the Civil War, the Homestead Act was passed that said if you were a veteran of the Civil War, or a widow of a veteran of the Civil War, you were entitled to apply to the federal government for a homestead. And those were 160 acres, which worked out swimmingly, I guess, in places like Ohio or places where they um, had you know, relatively consistent topography and availability of water and access to property. Not so well here. Uh, I own a cattle ranch in South County that consists of 95 homesteads. And every, ev almost all of the homesteaders would stay for five years and then d sell the, d which is what they need to do to get title, and then sell the property to a neighboring homesteader or abandon it because the, the topography, the climate, the excess availability of water it doesn't exist here. And so the homesteads act was great in the eastern United States or Midwest maybe even, but not here. So eventually, by the turn of the 20th century, they changed it to 320 acres in California. And by the early 20th century, it was 640 acres in California for homesteads. But it still, they couldn't make it. If you look at a population distribution of the state of California, what is it, 75% live within 60 miles of the ocean? It's because there's there's, most of that land that's on that map there is unusable for human, I mean, any intensive human habitation. You know, there's, there's no infrastructure, there's no roads, there's no water supply, and that's why the homesteads failed and the Homestead Act didn't work in the Western United States, which and is why the government ends up owning most of the property. Okay. So that does not exist anymore, that was officially Abandoned. Yeah, it, it ended in the early 20th Finish. century. Okay. In Alaska, actually, it went on to the early 60s, but the okay. rest of the United States, okay. it didn't. Okay. Um, if I may ask Jeanette a question, 51% of California um, are owned by the federal government and state governments. In addition, we have you know about 150 land trusts in um, in California that protect two and a half million acres of land, and the the biggest the land ranch land trust has protected 300,000 acres of land out of the 22 million acres that they own. Neither of uh, of those none of those acres are accessible to the public. Why and how have land trusts developed? What is their mission? and their common goal, and how much land should be protected from development? Thank you for that question. Um, yeah, before I answer that, I want to just touch on a point that I think is important. Um, you know, when we talk about the history of land use, we automatically jump to um, you know, when settlement happens here. Um, and I think it's important to recognize that that's very, it's a very new concept of, of land uh, use here in, you know, for our landscapes here. And that, you know, for you know, thousands of years, 10,000 plus years, we had sustainable land use by indigenous peoples here. And so just recognizing that our systems are, are pretty new, I think is important to always just lay that foundation because it sets a foundation for our relationship to land and how we think of land as, you know, how we commodify land. So um, I just wanted to just share that. <laughs> so um, land trusts come in, in, in all shapes and, and sizes and, um, and different missions. So they're not all the same, right? So uh, the many land trusts across even California, uh, I serve on the uh, board for the California Council of Land Trusts, and we have land trusts that uh, only focus on rangeland. And we have land trusts 
that uh, only focus on a portion of a river on this watershed. And we have land trusts that are more regional. So Big Sur Land Trust, we are a Monterey County-wide uh, land trust, starting out in Big Sur, uh, and then obviously moved um, out further to, to do more conservation there. And uh, the mission of land trusts are about private land, it's about conservation, taking private land, essentially, and conserving private land. And sometimes those lands are then transferred to public agencies for parks and open space. Like many examples here, Garland is an example of this, Pelicrona Regional Park. Uh, those you know, properties were acquired or they were portions of them and then transferred to the public for the public good. Another example or another way that land trusts uh, protect land is through conservation easements. So a lot of the range land and agricultural lands, uh, land trusts will conserve land through that legal tool, which is essentially purchasing the development rights of these properties. Uh, and then once they're purchased, they in, in, in some ways almost become extinct. So and then those lands are monitored uh, annually. Um, and then, of course, there are also lands that you can hold on. So Big Sur Land Trust also owns lands that we retain, that we use as nature preserves. So they are managed access, not the same as public access, but managed access because they either have really special resources or the um, access to them is a little bit tricky. So, for example, we uh, have a preserve uh, that is um, nestled in the middle of the Santa Lucia Preserve. Well. That obviously isn't going to be a public park because you'd have to go through that uh, development, that community development that's on private land. So that's an example of where it makes more sense for that to be a nature preserve. And, and that land was actually purchased from a timber uh, company. So thinking about, you know, you asked about if there's a common goal around, you know, for land trusts um, around conservation. And... Um, so the missions, although they may all be different, uh, they're all similar in that you know, they're all focused on you know, whether that's biodiversity of land, whether it's focused on uh, water, um, you know, saving water, water supply, whether it's focused on um, looking at things like parks and open space uh, or wildlife corridors. Um, they're all similar in that way, is that they are, they are, our, our missions are for the public benefit. So even though you can't access, you know, the land that's in conservation necessarily that, you know, for the public that's under a conservation easement that's held by the private landowner, there's still a public benefit because there's watershed benefits, there's wildlife benefits, and those benefit the residents of California to be able to have those enduring beautiful landscapes be maintained either as ranches. Uh, it helps, you know, with local food security. Um, there are a lot of benefits of having uh, private land conservation in place. So in terms of also just well, thinking about the broader common goal and, and thinking uh, about what, um, you know, is there a overall goal that California is trying to get to through conservation? You know, there is the 30 by 30 initiative that is underway. Um, and this idea is really from that uh, for a, a decade or so, scientists have um, agreed that in order uh, for there to be, you know, avoid ecosystem collapse and um, avoid, um, you know, essentially the, the future of humanity's fate uh, being um, you know, in, in major decline, that we need to really think about uh, how we're going to maintain uh, our lands and waters and that 30% of all of the lands and waters should be under some sort of conservation. Some people, you know, Wilson I think it said 50%, but I think there was some general agreement that 30% of lands and waters should be set aside uh, under a conservation state. So, in uh, 2020, um, the, the administration, uh, uh, the Newsom administration, uh, ended up uh, putting forward an initiative that was under 30 by 30 to join other nations, um, the United Nations, or many nations that were part of the UN um, in agreement on this 30 by 30 goal. 
And at the time, it was under the former uh, other administration, under the Trump administration, so the U.S. didn't join. But this really set California, I think, on the front, as California tends to always be sort of in the front when it comes to conservation and environment, uh, that California would commit to this 30%. So now, uh, the, the state has gone through a process where it's defined, well, what does conserved land mean for California, right? And uh, now um, that definition has been laid out as something that's very durable. So that's where land trusts come in because we do durable long-term conservation. Um, and that it you know, is something that continues to provide those ecosystem services and supports uh, many different species you know, on the land. So. And California does currently not have a 30% conservation already? No. So. Um, the way that conservation is defined, so we've got about 101 million acres in California. Uh, we have an estimate of about 24 million under conservation. So in the next eight years, there's about 6 million acres that are going to, uh, that, that we're going to try to conserve uh, under the 30 by 30 initiative. Very interesting. Thank you. Michael. Um, Landwatch Monterey states as their goal to fund projects that promote appropriate land use in Monterey County, in particular efforts to stop urban sprawl, protect critical habitat, preserve agricultural land, and guide better planning. What base data do you use to determine where development should happen and people should live? So let me expand a little bit on Landwatch and what we do to provide a little context. Um, we are uh, a nonpartisan, grassroots, um, data-driven organization. So we, um, uh, we work in the public interest around a set of principles, and we draw on data that comes out of uh, science, economics, um, a variety of different scientific disciplines. Um, so uh, we combine the science with a strong set of principles that are driven by what we know to be a good um, long-term conserving uh, actions with regard to, to development and growth. So things like establishing urban growth boundaries so that we don't sprawl and providing affordable housing for local working families. There's a whole series of these things. We are future looking, so we, we look at what exists today and we're trying to figure out, okay, how do we sustain the growth that we know is going to come into Monterey County? So the kind of data that we might look at is, uh, would start with the International Panel on Climate Change, the uh, climate assessments that California does. Uh, we're looking now at the local climate action plan, so we're evaluating those plans. And then we also look at things like housing data. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about that later, but. Um, you know, we use the set of principles and the data to help guide our, uh, our work. And our work is really about influencing local government. So we don't establish where development can occur or how much it can occur. That's the job of, of local governments. And our job is to try to influence them and push them and, and uh, through grassroots and through, you know, just data to move them to a place where they're looking beyond um, the interests of just today or the interests of just uh, local neighborhoods to be thinking more broadly about the issues that we're all confronting, climate change, the affordable housing crisis. So we have a, a, you know, a pretty different role from most other organizations. We're advocates for these principles. The, um, um, The uh, local plans and the regulations are where um, sort of it's determined where growth is going to occur. And uh, our job is to try to, you know, improve upon those as they exist and, you know, as I said, um, make them more sustainable. The other thing that drives growth and, and development and, and determines where it goes is just basic economics. And so you see that in our county very clearly with for example, housing prices. Um, to take two different examples, with climate, 
Um, you know, we know in our county, we know in California, there's been a steady rise in wildfires. This is just one of many different climate impacts that we can expect to continue to occur. So, you know, if you look at the trend line statewide, it looks like this. The data showed, uh, three years ago, it showed the largest fires were, um, you know, between 2010 and, and 2017. The data from 2020 changed all of that. So all of a sudden now, the, the biggest fires in the state of California occurred in 2020, dwarfing everything else. So we look at that data and we say, okay, we need to be thinking very carefully about policies um, in the county that allow people to continue to sprawl into high fire risk areas because it's dangerous for them, it's dangerous for first responders, it's expensive uh, for the public, um, and you know that's just good public policy to try to um, turn away from actions that we know are not going to be sustainable. All these areas are going to burn. I mean, that's indisputable. And so we're trying to figure out how do we develop communities in a way that they're going to be there for the long term. Another area where we you know, spend a lot of time, particularly now, is with housing. So um, the data shows that the average price, the, the median price of a house today in Monterey County is about $890,000. The median income of a family in Monterey County is $78,000. So there's no way families in Monterey County can afford single family homes. We've already approved roughly 20,000 single family homes. That's how many have been entitled but not built. And so my organization is trying to figure out, okay, how do we get local governments to address some of the issues that Tony brought up, which I think are really compelling, make it easier, faster, less expensive to build in cities where we know there's going to be the resources, the infrastructure, um, you can get people out of their cars, there's the opportunity to bike and walk. How do we reduce the, the cost? How do we increase the density? How do we have a different housing mix? So right now, virtually all the housing that's been approved in our county is single family homes. Very few apartments, very few condominiums, townhouses, smaller units that would be more likely to be affordable by people that work here. So again, those are two areas, climate and housing, where Landwatch is pushing local governments to try to have a different set of policies that in the long run will make um, you know, things here healthier, safer, better for, um, for the public. Thank you. Tony, would that mean then rezoning in this case? Uh, or, because isn't everything pretty set uh, where you can build what at this time in Monterey County? Well, the reality of Monterey County, well, maybe not Monterey County, certainly Monterey Peninsula, is that it's, it's not just what Michael said about the you know, regulatory constraints, which are many, but resource constraints. It wouldn't matter if every lot in the city of Monterey was zoned for 100 units, there's no water. So we can't build anything. They, the city of Monterey wrote the state recently and asked them to please lift the cease and desist order on California American Water Company so they could build affordable housing because on paper the city of Monterey I think still has something like 70 acre feet of water available to it to build housing and I have no doubt the state will turn a blind eye to that request. So, um, you know, all the, like SB8, I don't know if, how many people are familiar with that. That's a recent legislation that's supposed to mandate the ability to divide property. And that, that reg applies to about 2 to 5% of the cities in the state of California. So it's. Can you it explain why? Be, because the, the definitions are so, drawn so narrowly of what cities that would apply to, it doesn't apply to anybody. Or most, for most tents and purposes, does it can't be where you have a biologically sensitive area. It can't be where you don't have transportation. It can't be where you don't have water supplies. It can't be near a geologic fault. So when you add up all the, it can't be. It's most of the state. Mm -hmm. So it's that's the reality of it. You know, we we're good in the state of of passing a lot of legislation. We're good at that, but unfortunately. Most of it doesn't really do much to help solve the crisis that Michael's talking about, which is real. I, I heard a statistic once, and it's probably worse now, that 95% of the first-time homebuyers who would 
be first time home buyers in Monterey can't afford to buy their first home. And so that's, that's the reality of when you live in a place that everybody wants to have a, a VRBO or a second home or a 13th home in some cases, you know, that the, 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 the supply isn't there and the demand is taken up by people who can afford to pay whatever it is. And I think the city of Monterey is now over 60%, 60, 65% renters, which is not a healthy thing for, an, you know, a community. And Carmel is at least 50% second home. There's nobody in the wintertime. It's, it's empty because nobody comes and uses the houses there. So it's, and near the coast, the temptation for the VRBOs, or what do they call them, the, that, Picasso. yeah, Picasso thing that they just, somebody just tried in Carmel, not me, <laughs> uh, was, you know, that's a, you know, that's the, the supply will never keep up with the demand, unfortunately, in places like where we live, uh, because of those limitations on the ability to construct them and the pressures from outside to buy them. So, uh, Matthew, do you also see that the regulatory hurdles are really what drives up prices and what makes our area so not conducive to have you know, affordable housing and uh, accommodate more homeowners? Good topic, outstanding topic. Um, I'm happy to say that I've done a little bit to make it easier uh, when I was the city of San Juan Batista, they used to have a historical resources board and a planning commission, and uh, in a population of 1,300 people, this is about uh, 2007 I'm speaking of, and the then uh, city manager and I decided, let's get rid of the historical resources board. We'll get rid of an extra meeting every month. We'll get rid of uh, the headache of trying to staff the historical resources board and we'll uh, save money because Matthew is not going to have to write extra staff reports. So we combined the Historical Resources Board and the Planning Commission in the city of San Juan Batista as one entity. Bada bing, bada boom. Just a very small little streamline operation. Uh, in the city of Gonzales, um, something similar. Um, I went through the list of all the varieties of, of land uses and looked at um, the various zoning uh, categories those land uses are allowed and much of it, much of those land uses had to go to the planning commission to get the go-ahead to build. Well, my city manager at the time and I decided, let's not do that anymore. Let's, um, let's have some things go to the planning commission and let's have some other things um, and more things go through the administrative process, which means it would come to me at my desk as the community development director and I would review it and I'd write a brief staff report and go through the, uh, the uh, mechanical process to explain to the property owner that their project is approved with slight changes. Um, now, keep in mind that if there's changes that uh, the applicant would like that, are, that uh, don't jive with our general plan and our, or our zoning code, then I would say, oh, I'm sorry, but you're gonna have to go to the planning commission. So, Small little pieces like that, small little events uh, that tell, help streamline the, the development process. And everybody's very grateful for it, by the way, as, as they go through these jurisdictions to build something. Uh, on the subject of CEQA, over the years, <clears throat> I, I vaguely recall, and maybe Michael and Jeanette and Tony will remember, wasn't there something in CEQA that said you're, not supposed, you're supposed to keep it under 150 pages? <laughs> I think it was 150 pages, and uh, I thought, what a good idea, but I don't think it ever uh, happened that way. Uh, I know it never happened that way. Um, and by the way, speaking of CEQA documents, uh, I was one of the authors of the uh, four-door base reuse plan and the EIR, and if you were around back in those days, this would have been in the mid-90s, so the big, the big lift was 94 through 97, uh, and, and following the release of the draft EIR for the four-door base reuse plan, uh, it was discussed, well, do we do a 45-day public review period? And in, in a nanosecond, that got squelched. It was, no, hell no, we're not going to do this, ma this massive project with this huge uh, environmental document. We're not going to subject people to a 45-day public review period. So it ended up being 90 days. And um, anyway, back to CEQA. So, over the years, fortunately, there's been some back off 
uh, through the CEQA process, the input from all the professionals and the, and the trades, uh, the CEQA trades, and the lawyers such as Tony saying, you know, why do we have to do this? Can't we do this instead? So there are some, there are some ways that uh, developments don't have to be subjected to um, the CEQA process, and I'm very thankful for that. And there still needs to be more of that sort of stuff. Well, at the moment, as we all know, the whole process is paralyzed at, at, at Monterey County. So what would it take, I don't know, each one of you to contribute, um, what ideas are out there to actually really, I mean, we've had a streamlined committee for uh, 10 years. I, it's only gotten worse, really. So where, what, what shall... That's because I wasn't on your do? committee. If yeah. I'd been on your committee... <laughs> I'm not on the committee either. So uh, what do you think, what ideas are out there to really, does it take a complete overhaul? Is it just underfunding? Or what, why does this culvert cost $65,000 to approve? Yeah, I've actually never had a client who complained about the fee other than they thought that the magnet, you know, obviously very expensive. They thought they at least should be able to be processed for the fee. So I've, I've, in fact, many times testified to the Board of Supervisors when they raise the fees that that's great, but you have to provide the service, too. I, I don't know how, long, how many clients I'd have if I sent them bills every month and never did anything. You know, they'd, eventually you'd run out of clients. Same with architects, I suspect. <laughs> if they asked for their drawings and you showed them a blank piece of paper and sent them bills. So, yeah, it, it's a... It's, you know, I've been almost 40 years, I guess next year will be 40 years doing this here. And it's, this, it's a recurring story, you know, lack of experienced staff, lack of adequate staff, lack of political motivation to see something happen. You know, I, you know nobody likes to stand up and be criticized in public, except lawyers, I guess. But the, you know, the planning department staff is scared to make decisions. This is, I'm talking about, you know, over the course of 40 years, it's, it re, you can see it in jurisdiction after jurisdiction. The county may just be the poster child for it, but the, you know, the, they're afraid to make a recommendation. They're afraid to make a decision which could they, someone could criticize them for on the staff level. They're afraid to be criticized for not requiring every possible technical study on the checklist uh, even ones that make no, you know, practical sense whatsoever, uh, you know, looking for uh, endangered species inside under the footprint of an existing building or things like, you know, this. But that way you can't be criticized for saying, why didn't you require that report? Because you required that report. So I, th I think it's a systemic problem which is difficult to fix because there has to be the political will to fix it. And honestly, all you have to do is look at the elections in Monterey County to see there's anyone standing up saying, let's make development easier here. Mm -hmm. You know, that's just not the way it works here. And so it, it's always going to be expensive. It's always going to be slow. And it's always going to be difficult. And that's, that's the reality of it. I mean, when, when the plans show, for example, Mid Valley Shopping Center, which is just down the road here, you know what that's designated for in the county's general plan of 2010? An affordable housing project overlay. Now, what affordable housing project is going to be built on the Mid Valley Shopping Center that has no sewer system, no water, and is obviously developed with existing commercial development? I mean, that's, that isn't solving any housing problem on top of putting it, the overlay in a place where there's no mass transit and no, you know, no jobs, no nothing. So, you know, we're... That's our problem, is the, the plans are written in a way that isn't going to produce affordable housing or, you know, enough housing to make housing affordable, nor is the system designed or set up to allow that housing to be built. Mr. Eastwood and Mr. Williams just finished a project at the mouth of the Carmel Valley that you may have read about a year or so ago. That took 16 years to get through the entitlement process. So they... Uh, that, that probably precludes a lot of affordability when you think of what was, what was added up in expenses and attorney's fees and expert reports. So yeah, it, it would require, and I don't see that happening, a, a complete seed change in how things are dealt with here. And 
I want, I want so, to add to that oh. the the um, the you're discussing the county and how they behave and how things operate in the county, but when you get into places like Salinas and Gonzales and Soledad, it's not as stringent and things move move a bit faster. No, you're saying the no. food bank was required. I was I've been mean, astounded. They had and. I don't want to quote a wrong number now, but they had a mind-boggling amount of fees and hurdles to construct a food bank. And we're just going through the expansion of the food bank. A similar story. So unfortunately, no, it's not Is that really Salinas? Much the yes, city yeah, city of Salinas. But what I heard you say was it's it's a people management problem, but also a, a how land use plans are written, if I may summarize yeah, that. I mean, uh, ultimately, you can't blame the planner for the fact the system doesn't work. Because mm -hmm. they're just a pawn in the in the process, and you know I don't, I don't think anybody in the planning department I've, I've never run across anybody in all these years that I thought boy they're really out to make this system worse or you know they really want to make it as difficult as they can. Mm -hmm. I think most of them are well-meaning people trying to get their job done. But I, Matthew was telling me when he worked at the county, somebody said oh somebody quit so Matthew here's another 90 projects for you to take care of whatever mm -hmm. it was. I mean how are you going to yeah, do that? You yeah. can't. That's people. You that's a management problem. Though. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Would you agree with that assessment? Well, yes. I mean, I, I think even as a conservation organization trying to do a restoration project for a long Carly, time, correct. we have the same hurdles that we have to go through. So, I think about our Carmel River Free Project, um, which is our floodplain restoration environmental enhancement. I mean, the end result is a conservation outcome. And yet we have had to go through the same, we might as well be built, trying to build a, a, you know, a Walmart in the floodplain. I mean, it, it's almost, it's very similar. Uh, that being said, I do see a bright spot that's coming down from the state level. Um, and that is under Secretary Crowfoot's you know, leadership. There is a cutting the green tape initiative. And maybe that'll trickle down. How about that? Wouldn't that be something if you know, conservation philosophy somehow trickled down <laughs> to benefit others? Which it always does, really, but <laughs> it's a long term. <laughs> um, but uh, that uh, the Cutting the Green Tape Initiative um, is a streamlined path uh, when there is, when the net result is really, not even the net result, but when the, it is focused on restoration. Uh, and so um, there are a number of pilot projects right now that are going through the state that they are exploring to see which projects um, they might want to look at uh, to just see if they can figure out a way to take this giant beast of sequa and try to uh, you know, make it a little bit more simple uh, for projects that are really geared towards restoration, which I think is promising because if they can do that for environmentally based projects, then maybe there's a next step, you know, so uh, for affordable housing and, and, and others. So. And who decides and has to agree to that this is a conservation project? Um, so it's really all the agencies. So there really has to demonstrate, you know, that there's some, you know, that, that there's conservation intent. So for example, we have another project that we're working on um, that is in the middle of Salinas. It's building a park in the city of Salinas. And we're hoping that maybe, it's too late for our Carmel River Free Project, unfortunately. <laughs> we're way, way down the, down the uh, road on that one. But for the Car Lake Project, um, there, you know, there's a possibility that that could happen. But because there's also a parks development and, you know, um, p uh, piece of it where we're actually gonna be developing a traditional park uh, it may or may not qualify, and we don't really know if it could. So, you know, right now, I think it has to be a pure restoration, you know, intent sort of project with no added, you know, no, no other elements. No added benefits. <laughs> at this time. I mean, there are benefits. There's flood management benefits. There's, you know, water quality benefits. Um, so, but... Park means... Meaning, like, a, a playground... You know, um, it, there also will be a large open space area as well, but because the traditional park is going to have structures and it could have like a community center and all that, then it sort of makes it sort of a gray area a little bit, you know, so. Mike, do you have anything to... Well, I, I've just been reflecting on uh, Tony's observations, which, uh, you know, I concur with. The, the regulatory process is nuts. 
um, it makes it really, really difficult to build in the right places, the right kind of developments. And so, um, you know, in recent years, the, uh, there's been a movement in the state legislature to uh, try to streamline housing. And I think there will continue to be bills. Uh, Scott Weiner and others have tried to, you know, basically cut through a lot of the regulatory structure that's been built up at the local level. So these are all local decisions. There's no reason a local government couldn't have objective standards, no review by, you know, five different commissions, and have it ministerially approved over the counter. There's no reason they can't do that. The reason they don't do it is because uh, we are in the tyranny of the status quo. And so the, the status quo is something that's been developed over the history of you know, California, the last 100 years of regulatory land use uh, management. And those of us who are looking out to the future and saying, okay, we've got a housing problem, we have a uh, climate problem, the regulatory structure is actually impeding solutions to both those issues. And so I think you'll see more and more Organizations like Landwatch very, and some very traditional conservation groups, uh, Natural Resources Defense Council and others just saying, hey, we need housing, multifamily housing in cities, higher densities. We need to get, you know, make people, uh, give people the option to bike and walk to their work. And we need to make regulations go away that impede those kind of good, smart developments. And unfortunately, you know, here locally, um, all the same problems that exist everywhere else in the state. I mean, they're just, they're, they're, they're magnified, uh, you know, because as Tony points out, super high demand, very beautiful area. Um, you know, people come here from all over the world. Um, you know, those are, so. Since 1848. <laughs> right, but, but I would say there, there's sort of three things we look at. One is the regulatory structure. That's something we can change. Uh, we can't really change demand. So the demand that's going to take place, that's not a lot of, you know, something that anybody can do. People love this area. And the other thing that's really very difficult to impact are housing, building costs. So labor, material, outside of regulatory things. So, re so uh, labor, um, uh, land, and uh, materials. Those are just, have gone up extraordinarily high, as you know. Um, and you know, it makes it really, really difficult on top, at layering on top the regulatory uh, costs, it makes it, you know, virtually impossible to build things that could be affordable to local working families. So our focus is on that regulatory piece because that's the piece we think we can make some um, headway on and, you know, try to streamline things for the right kind of developments in the right places. And how are you doing that? Well, we have, uh, you know, we lobby local governments. We have uh, a housing uh, deputy, my deputy director only works now on housing. So as um, every, every jurisdiction, every local government in Monterey County has to update their housing element, that gives us an opportunity to advance a whole variety of ideas around streamlining, around objective standards, around um, you know, ministerial processing of permits. So we are you know, trying to work through the regulatory process and the political process to change the, the way things are at the local level. Um, and you know, part of Landwatch's base are you know, our supporters. We send them alerts, we try to get them out to meetings, we get letters written. So, um, you know, I invite anyone who cares about these issues to take a look at our website and sign up for our newsletter and, you know, try to, to follow the kind of work we do because it's going to be a full court press on housing elements over the next two years. That's going to be a big issue. And you have two meetings coming up or two workshops coming up in regards to exactly. housing elements. Yeah, there's one on the peninsula and there's one in Salinas and I think we just sent out a newsletter the other day about those. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's very admirable work. Um, to, you know, pull back maybe as a last question to everybody a little bit, it, um, th there's, despite all the difficulties and despite all the high cost, there's enormous pressure on our area and I think on California as a whole. 
uh, but at the same time we have these you know huge issues with fire and uh, water scarcity uh, in everywhere we go, you know, there is certain that in architecture we call it occupancy ratings. So the government controls, you know, how many people can sit in a restaurant and how many people can, you know, occupy this venue. My question is, is there anyone out there that actually figures out what the occupancy rating is for California? So um, let, let me start by saying, um, Occupancy ratings probably uh, along those lines work great in places that don't have democracies. And I think in a democracy, it's really hard to limit um, population or you know, growth. So I think it's a, um, I don't envision the government doing that. Um, if you look at the data in California over the last 20 years, you'll see you know, our population has gone up, our per capita greenhouse gas emissions has gone down, and our overall greenhouse gas emissions have gone down. So um, one could argue that our state, and that's not true of m very many states, by the way, so one could argue that if climate is your primary concern, and I think for those of us who work on it um, and believe that, you know, it's the existential issue in our time, I mean, it's going to determine whether planet is habitable, that places like California that are doing a really good job with their electric grid and a really good job with renewables really are places where more people um, should be than in Texas where, you know, they're burning natural gas and they're contributing to greenhouse gases like crazy. So, um, you know, we somehow need to figure out the right set of incentives that are um, helping, you know, reduce greenhouse gas emissions and, you know, if, if we can't address that, the, the occupancy is, is going to be, it, it's not going to matter. I mean, it's really just not going to matter. Well, I'm not sure because there is, you know, people do need water to drink and people and water to live and they need food to eat and they need a place to live. And I think it is very much a head in the sand if I don't look at how much land we have and how much can the, we, we talked last time, you know, how much can the globe support, but uh, that would also be true for a state. Uh, what are your thoughts, Jeanette? Well, I mean, I think it's, it's, it's an interesting question if you think about it in you know, natural systems. It's a lot easier, or I don't know if it's easier, but it's, um, you know, in a natural system, you know, you have, you know, a set of abiotic and biotic factors that would determine a carrying capacity of any given landscape. I think with, you know, human ingenuity over time, um, and, and it's, it's, you know, been more recent, actually. I, mean, I think historically, a lot of our cities, even if, you know, if, if they couldn't figure out ways to feed themselves, um, they didn't have the resources, then uh, cities and, you know, and, and societies would collapse. I think in the U.S., with a lot of ingenuity and, um, and you know, progress in technology, we've been able to really, um, you know, create additional carrying capacity that really is dependent upon broad distribution systems and really complex, um, you know, just systems to be able to bring in resources from quite a distance. And so what might be typical of a, you know, of, of, a, of say a food shed, which would be, you know, here on the Central Coast, we have a lot of, um, you know, I think we stand a better chance than probably other parts of the country, given how much food we can grow here, the climate, and the resources here, we still, you know, have a lot of dependence on, on things that are, are from abroad. So um, just thinking about carrying capacity, I think it's difficult to, um, uh, to anticipate what types of technologies in the future could increase capacity, you know, for, for humans to live here. And I also think that, you know, unless we take a very aggressive approach um, you know, to looking at more, you know, circular systems, whether that's recycling all of our waste, recycling all of our food, recycling all of our water, we're, we're facing our limits here pretty quickly. And as we know, you know, the farther your, your, distributions, uh, your distribution of your goods are coming from, the more vulnerable they are you know, to 
all kinds of things, which I think we've been seeing you know, more recently in distribution. So I think that you know, we need to act now and make those changes now. Uh, and I also agree that in a democracy setting, that, that capacity number is a bit problematic. So you know, I think that requires a real behavioral shift in how we think about everything, right? And I'm just as guilty, right? Because I'm like, you know, I'm very aware about climate change. I work in this field, and yet, you know, I had a banana at breakfast this morning that, you know, came from a pretty far distance. And so we all need to be thinking about those incentives and other things that I think really force us to make good decisions um, and making sure that, you know, the, the easy decisions are also the right decisions for, you know, our future sustainability. So, so let me just add, uh, back in the 70s, there was a book called The Limits to Growth written by Club of Rome, a group of people at Yale. And, you know, it had various projections about running out of uh, uh, minerals and metals and so on and so forth. The, the piece that the book missed was that um, as things get scarce, prices go up and uh, people use less of them. They either conserve or they're substitution. So they use something different. And I think that that's kind of an ongoing story for, um, you know, the technology, how it's allowed us to, um, you know, put more people in a particular place. Now, going back to Tony's point about water, uh, we anticipate over the next few years, I think most people do, the expansion of the Pure Water Project. And we should have recycled water being delivered to the peninsula, which should lift the CDO. However, the cost of that water is going to be, you know, roughly a couple thousand dollars a square, uh, an acre foot. The current, the current, probably more. The current, the current water is, you know, small hundreds of dollars because the first increment of cheap water back in the, you know, when they put in the dams here, was inexpensive. The next increment is recycled water. That's a couple thousand. If they do desal, you're looking at, you know, two, three, four x that. So yes. There are solutions. Those solutions become more expensive as um, you know scarcity starts uh, coming. Uh, you know, fa we face it as a society, and that will have its own impacts in terms of uh, you know the distribution and affordability and equity in our local area. So um, you know, all of those things are, are playing out at the local level. They're playing out across the globe, and I think. Um, you know, it's just going to be a, a much more difficult place, um, our county and other places, to live because we're going to run into scarcity and it's going to drive up costs and, and things like that. So, so Tony, would you agree that this is just an, it naturally would uh, resolve itself? How many people will be able to live in California? Actually, I'm feeling a lot better about myself because for breakfast this morning, I had a piece of cold pizza. From, <laughs> and and it, it, it came from La Bici Clay, a block and a half away. So I feel like, who's the real environmentalist here? That's what I'm saying. Anyway, uh, you know, I, I think for, on, the local, on the local or statewide basis, you know, we're, we're reaching saturation. Uh, not because there's nowhere else to build here, but it's just that the things we are building here are such dribs and drabs of one house here, or one ADU there, or, or one, you know, whatever, hotel, which is obviously not housing. But, you know, the, now we're talking about, you know, breadcrumbs in terms of providing housing opportunities here. In the, in, until and unless we have a new view of how we're going to provide water and transportation for our state, uh, there isn't much left. I mean, have you ever been? Have you been on the 405 freeway in Los Angeles lately? I mean, you could walk faster probably than you can drive there. And where do we build the high-speed rail to Corcoran, or to wherever those places are? You know, Avenal. Yeah, that's a great. Everybody wants to go there. <laughs> yeah, that's a, yeah. And of course, the reason we built it there is because. No one had the courage to say we need it where the people are, which is up and down the coast or within, you know, short distance of the coast. And so w there isn't, there, you can't make the 405 any wider and solve the problem. You can't strike a rock and produce water. 
we, we have to come, you know, whether it's desal or reclaimed water. I mean, there aren't going to be any more dams built in the state of California. You can get over that. And the rivers, when I was a kid, the steelhead used to, you could, you could see the steelhead in the Carmel River. I mean, there's, but when I was here, I thought the carrying capacity of the state was 8 million because that's how many people were here when I was born. But now it's 38 million. So, yeah, I mean, without, without a complete redo, uh, you know, rethinking of, how we provide for people here in the state, you know, we're we're there. <laughs> there isn't any, you know, there, any, anything more is going to anything that we do now is going to have an incremental impact on everyone's quality of life. And that that doesn't mean a house in Pebble Beach or a, an ADU in Carmel Valley or a whatever. You know that 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 isn't the that is neither the cause of the problem or the problem or the solution. You know, this, the, we have to going to have to approach things differently and provide resources to places where things can be built, or we're going to suffer where we are now, which is, you know, houses that should be a hundred thousand dollars or a million dollars. And I maybe it, in my old age I've become a cynic, but I don't, I don't see there being a solution in my lifetime. Well, that I should have had Jeanette. Uh, speak at the end because it was so hopeful until we got to you. <laughs> bring, it, maybe, bring us back up Matthew, again. Bring, yeah, us, bring us back up. <laughs> Matthew, you'll have the last word then. Uh, okay. What is your um, take on it? So water is definitely a factor. And uh, I think there's another tier below that, and that is the transportation system, I think, is... Uh, poor in the state of California. Like I said in my presentation, we have a two-legged transportation system. We need a three-legged transportation system. And within that, uh, we need more roundabouts because uh, there are really 90% um, fewer fatalities and incapacitating injuries associated with roundabouts. Uh, about 30% less vehicle emissions associated with roundabouts. Um, less noise with, associated with roundabouts. And uh, it's just, uh, when you look at road diet between uh, signalized intersections and roundabout intersections, the, the diet, road diet for a, a, a roundabout system, which you're going to get on Highway 68 in my lifetime, uh, it's going to vastly improve traffic flow. But it, it, only can, it can only carry so much traffic before it also yes. plugs up. And lastly, I want to say, uh, regarding water, uh, I'm going to buy a one-foot-wide strip of the state of Oregon between the Pacific Ocean and the Snake River, and when they decide to pump, uh, put in a pipeline between the Columbia River and the north extreme of the California aqueduct system, I will charge a, a royalty when they <laughs> pass my property. Well, it looks like it takes a group like you to solve problems, so I think there should be a new initiative to... Uh, tackle all these obstacles that are in the way of, of, of good, sustainable development. So with that, I want to thank you all for participating tonight and turn the mic over to Eric, who will ask the audience if they have any questions. Thank you, Marianne. Thank you, everyone. I think I may start off the questioning by bringing it back to something near and dear to most of the audience, which is good design. Do you have, any of you have thoughts about how architects, designers, urban designers, and urban planners can help be part of the solution to some of these problems we've talked about tonight and how good design can somehow help and push things forward? Sure. Uh, make it objective. Figure out a way to have design standards that don't require the interpretation of an architectural review board, a planning commission. You know, make them specific, predictable, um, and certain for developers. And, uh, you know, that will go a long way. Because what I see happening is there's this loop of, oh, that's bad design, you know, at a commission level. Oh. So they go back and redesign it. Oh, no, that's, and there's somebody else the next time that's bad design. So I think those standards somehow need to be, you know, um, presented in a way and defined in a way so that it isn't always subjective um, based on the people who are serving. 
I don't, I don't think I've ever worked with a bad architect here. <laughs> I did have one from New York once who was famous for building high rises and he did a house locally here and when he sent me the rendering it looked exactly like a high rise. And I, <laughs> so I suggested maybe adding more trees to the rendering to keep it. <laughs> but, um, you know, in all seriousness, the, the problem isn't the architectural profession, the problem is the process. You know, I've, I'm sure any, any architect on this peninsula or in this county could design a, a project that provided lots of housing or was efficient in its, in its use of the land or was, uh, you know, efficient in, in the use and how it addressed the environment. The problem is, as I think Michael said, was you've got to get through the process. And so I, I remember a former county supervisor told me he ran for city council in Monterey because he, he was a builder and he showed up at the Architecture Review Committee with this nice house that was kind of an East Coast style and it had bay windows and someone on the Architecture Review Committee said, I hate bay windows. If you want bay windows, I'll, well, you'll never approve this. Take out the bay windows. Mm -hmm. you know, what does that have to do with, any, you know? That, so that, that's the problem, objectivizing it or you know, have, making the process rational would certainly assist in accomplishing the goals. I guess I'll speak to just you know, landscape architecture, which I know is a little bit different, but I'd say in that process, particularly when looking at community um, assets, that there's more community involved in the decision-making process around what, what, what they want in their community. So I think about, um, often I think, you know, organizations or, or um, builders come and say, I think this is what the community wants and we're gonna build it like this and you know, they're gonna enjoy all these different amenities. And I think about how different of a process it is when we ask people what do they want and bring them in and make sure that you know, lots of voices are being heard around planning for community assets. Um, so that's my small plug-in. I know it's not necessarily you know, architecture design in the same way, but I think it's important uh, as we think about um, how uh, you know people in the profession of around land use and architecture can also help you know, look for ways that improve communities broadly. So, Matthew, uh, if the architects were a hindrance to building housing, you'd be up shit creek. Let me tell you right now. But you guys are doing a great job. It's I, I like what you do overall. I don't, I don't see uh, how you could possibly affect uh, densities uh, in, jur in jurisdictions that already allow the densities. I, I think, you're, I think you're, well, I guess your profession is going in the right direction. I guess my thought about it is to sort of begin to apply solid urban design principles about cities to make them livable, more sustainable, more vital, and contribute to the dialogue with uh, jurisdictions and city officials so that they, you know, we contributed to, to giving them ideas about how to make policies, how to make rezonings, how to incentivize some of those. I see what you mean. H have you been to Morgan Hill lately? Have you seen what they've been doing in the I've heard downtown about area? Been, also on the east side of the highway. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'd take a trip up there and see what's going on. It's pretty interesting. Okay. Well, thank you. Any more questions? And let me come to you so we get it taped. Well, this has been a really great discussion. Um, um, my question is, how can the, you know, how can we empower the public to push local government towards uh, making more sustainable communities, more multifamily housing, better transit? Um, wh what's your suggestion for the public's involvement? I, at the risk of getting my head shut off from behind, I think Michael's <laughs> done a, a, you know, Michael explained how that is, it's through engagement. You know, you have to show up at the meetings, you have to make your, your wishes known, you have to let the elected officials know that there's, there's not just people who object to things being built, that there's people who want housing built. A, a recent, it recently in a, one of the Monterey Peninsula cities, uh, in order to prevent the construction of ADUs, they enacted a water moratorium on their own water system that had, had water capacity because they didn't want to build ADUs, so, you know, if, if, a, 
if enough people showed up at that jurisdiction and said, no, we want ADUs or we want multifamily housing, don't do this. That, that's how my observation of how it works is the decision makers have to make a decision, I guess. So I think Tony just did an ad for Landwatch, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so so uh, join our newsletter, uh, get involved. We'll give you plenty of opportunities to help move the process. Um, you know, that's what we do every day. And, um, you know, I, I find myself in front of planning commissions and city councils and, you know, trying to move the needle. And, it, and it's, uh, well, it's not a needle, it's a, it's a wrecking ball. So um, it's a boulder up the hill. It's a boulder up the hill. It, 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 yeah. 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 But we all know that the legend of Sisyphus, where he's rolling the ball up to the top of the mountain and it rolls back down, but over time he wears down the mountain so it becomes flat. What, what about the story of Hercules cleaning the manure out of the, you know? The, I don't know Hercules or his I manure. I think he got stuck in it, dealing with manure for eternity. Can, can you say that in Greek, Mike? Pardon me? <laughs> Can you explain that in Greek? <laughs> no, I, I'm Italian, sorry. Okay. <laughs> uh, any other questions? I'm just going to ask, probably, Tony, the history of the prohibition against development on 20% slope. I'm curious about that. We live in an ag area. Most of the cultivated ground is less than 20% slope. so. And most of us go visit communities around the world because of their unique character on more than 20% slope. Where did that, how did that originate in, in, the, in many jurisdictions around the world? It was incorporated into place. the 1982 general plan. As Richard can correct me when I, if I misspeak. It was 30% slopes originally. The, uh, the technical reason for it, which was then reduced to 25% slope, in the current it's at 25 percent in the current general plan, but the 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 ex, I won't say excuse, but maybe that could be an equally operative word, was to prevent erosion or de you know development on slopes that would be unstable. Of course, as you pointed out, you can build something on with the proper engineering, but it also is a convenient way to eliminate a lot of or make more difficult a lot of land to be developed because if you take the everything which is over 30% or now 25, which isn't all that steep, you know, that's, uh, and make it either undevelopable or more difficult to develop, it has that effect of taking property off the table for development and that's been you know, an effective tool to do that. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I heard a lot of agreement between Tony and Michael tonight and it's always been my uh, idea with the with the county after 40 years of land use practice here that you really need uh, an overarching uh, shock to the system and doing it on a case-by-case -case basis is uh, well it, it's failed for the last 40 years so um, I would suggest with this kind of agreement that we think about a referendum. And uh, of course, Land Watch had one in the 2007 or eight or whatever it was with the general plan. And, you know, I mean, they, then of course they won it or lost it. There was competing, it was a, you know, it was a mess. Uh, then the general plan was adopted in 2010. And of course, nothing has happened with the implementation <laughs> for 12 years. Uh, so I would, uh, I, would, uh, I would like to see a meeting of the minds uh, between the, you know, between the Tonys of the world and Mikes of the world um, and, you know, force it, uh, get the public to support it and force it upon the, uh, uh, the county. Uh, otherwise, I don't see anything happening. That's my idea. Let's speak. I, I can get um, with, uh, there seems to be a national movement to destroy uh, single family zoning. Um, could that be the horse that then starts to pull the cart of the infrastructure building to support that? 
The, I mean, the answer is maybe. <laughs> Great lawyer answer. The, uh, you know, it should be, I guess, and you're right that, you know, the, I think the, the excuse for failed land use planning is things like that, like we're going to require every city to build two houses in where there have been one, and we're going to ignore single family zoning instead of zoning proper, prop, more property to make it available for single family development or multifamily development or, you know, larger projects. For example, on the Monterey Peninsula, every project I've gotten entitled in the last five years for an office building, we're re-entitling as apartments because there is no demand for office building. The city of Marina has been working on its downtown general plan, redevelop, replan, I forget they have a revitalization plan for a decade maybe, I don't, it, it hasn't, nothing's happened. And they're stuck in this paradigm of we're gonna have all this retail space in the downtown. Well, th there's no demand for retail space anywhere. I mean, let alone in downtown Marina because it's, it's not a, you know, a tourist area. It's not a, a high population area. Everybody gets everything from Amazon now, as best I can tell, or at least large, large percentage of their purchases are online now, not in brick and mortar stores. And I've had a couple of clients trying to build multifamily housing, including significant affordability percentages. We can't even get an application from them because like, well, we have to finish our downtown vitalization plan and we want mixed use with retail below and residential above. It's like, that's never gonna happen. So it's gonna sit here with all these vacant storefronts or un underutilized land because their, their mindset is in a planning paradigm of, I don't know, Matthew probably can tell me better, but maybe from the 90s or the early 2000s or the 80s or something when Everybody thought we we're going to have, you know, a, a shoemaker on the bottom floor is going to live above it, and that's that's not happening, you know. That 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 is not happening. And as long as we can't get past that that mindset and start, you know, allowing people, because there are people out there will provide, you know, if you allow it, it will come, you know. If we set up the system so that people can build these things, they will build them, you know. If there's infrastructure there, if there's you you know. Uh, services there, if the water's there, if the sewer's there, and, and the land use planning, but I've literally, in downtown Marina, I've got a piece of property that has been waiting to be able to build an affordable apartment or apartment project with high affordability for seven, eight, nine, I don't know how many years it's been now, because we can't get a general downtown plan done at the city. So until we get past that, we're not going anywhere. <laughs> I, I asked if the state bill is, is helping with this, but it, no. the answer was no. Is maybe the, the realization of the housing crisis making that, maybe those people may think twice about it or push that a little f more forward? Because it seems like the state laws, the SB 8, 9, and 10, they're, those didn't exist before. I mean, there, there seems to be a real realization across a lot of fronts that we're in trouble, we need a lot more housing, and we just got to make it happen. There's problem solving going on in the state of California and in Monterey County, where we all live, and uh, I'm happy to say that TAMSI is uh, awake to uh, roundabouts, and they're looking at <laughs> Highway 68 being a string of roundabouts at all those intersections. And that will allow us to have, uh, hopefully, just two-lane road through uh, Highway 68. Um, I, I just had a quick question for, well, two quick clarifications. Um, uh, Michael, you mentioned earlier in your presentation that there were 20,000 units of housing that were approved but not built in Monterey. Can, can you clarify that statistic? It's uh, that is the statistic. I can send the spreadsheet. So that is uh, that is um, developments throughout the county, uh, including probably 9,000, I think now in uh, Salinas. That's the north. 
North Central plan and the, yeah. So uh, we have all, every development identified uh, if it's been approved and unbuilt, and we total up the number of units, and every year we keep track roughly of how many have been built. So, and they're almost all sing single family homes. Okay. So, you know, if you go here uh, in Carmel Valley, I mean, off the top of my head, September Ranch, uh, um, Rancho Cañada, uh, um, um, I, I don't know, but uh, Montera, uh, Santa Lucia, um, Tehama, uh, did I say September Ranch? I mean, there's just, you know, there's a lot of projects. Now, these are all super high-end projects, right? But still, that's what's been approved. And then if you go into the valley, there's, you know, lots and lots there. And there, there's a ton in um, Marina. And, and you know, there's a campus town, which is 1,500 or something like that. Uh, it's, it's sort of a staggering yeah, it's, statistic. It's, 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 it's sort it's, of amazing. It's a huge number. It's yeah. a giant number. City um, of Gonzales is looking at something like 6,200 homes. So, so the city of Gonzales is is planning to go from 2,000 homes to 8,000 homes. They're planning to quadruple. Um, they're you know they're annexing a, a large chunk of farmland, and I mean the numbers are, are kooky. I yeah. mean there, there's no chance that that's going to be uh, built. And you know, I mean if you look at the inventory, I just I don't see how. It's um, the other question I wanted to ask, and Tony, during while you were speaking, you mentioned that 50% um, of the housing stock in the city of Monterey is rentals? Did I think it's 60, actually. 60? Okay. And you implied afterwards that that's not a good thing. And I'm just wondering, we, we've talked a lot about ideological shifts in our approach to development, and I wonder how many of our current problems are based on the fact that we tend to approach home ownership as the end-all, be-all. And if that needs to evolve as we move towards densification of urban cores and things like that. Yeah, the, there, there's certainly no question that everyone can't afford, I don't care where you live, you know, whether it's in Monterey or in Fresno or wherever else. That's where I was born. That's why I picked Fresno. But, the, you know, ba Baker, no, that's a, Bakersfield, whatever. Not everyone's going to be able to afford a home. It's just the reality of it, you know, that, that not everyone has a job. That's going to or you know ability to generate enough money to to buy a home, especially when interest rates aren't free, eventually. But the uh, the other reality is, a home is pe generally speaking the only way that people actually save any significant money amount of money. It's the equity you develop by paying a mortgage. That really is. Um, the way that Americans save, nobody has a big, or most people don't have large savings account, they save in by buying a home. And so it's a, whether it's a, you know, a town home or a single family dwelling, I mean, the, it's all relative, but yeah, I, if, if home ownership is no longer a desirable thing, then we ought to be zoning for higher density housing. And, you know, that's the more of the European model. You know, a lot of places in Europe, you don't own a home. <laughs> you know, it doesn't, that isn't going to happen in your lifetime. But my experience has been, you know, representing clients for a long, many decades now, that that's a lot of people, when they get to be my age now, uh, they, that's their savings, is the equity in their home. And that's how they afford to retire, or that's how they afford to be taken care of when they can't take care of themselves anymore. So, you know, that's, a, that's the difficulty is the, avail the availability isn't going to be there for everybody to be able to do that in the future. But it's also the way that, at least in the 20th, 20, late 19th, 20th, and early 21st century, that's how our society's been constituted. So I just uh, would go back to the numbers that I uh, mentioned. Uh, the median income in the county is 78,000. The median house price is 890,000. So the only option for most of the people, working families, is rental. That is the only option. The, 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 you know, I think the hope would be we would have that missing middle so that people can start in a rental and then move into a small condo and you know, kind of move up the ladder. Today we have virtually you know, very few apartments in the pipeline, tons of single family homes, and nothing in the middle. 
So, um, That's the 20,000 Almost all, almost all single family homes. So, you, you know, we've just done a, a, a poor job in terms of public policy of driving the wrong kind of housing in the wrong places for, you know, quite some time. I think in addition to that, one of the challenges is that I, there's a lot of downsizing happening with the baby boomer population. So they're, the big houses aren't working for them, so they're moving into smaller houses. Well, young people can't afford to jump into those other houses. And so that's also, I think, adding to the dearth of any sort of reasonable housing for folks to be able to purchase, even if I mean, it's hard anyway. So. Do I see another question? We don't. Oops, yes. Um, I really appreciated the historical overview for California. I was just curious, do you guys have maybe like a, a good case study that would compare um, what, like the population growth because uh, like as a state, we are the largest state in the country, and I'm just curious if there's maybe like a city around the world um, that is a good case study that kind of compares the relative growth and the adjustment as we as they um, adjusted to their housing um, stock and solving that issue. It may be a very broad question, but I'm just curious if anybody has a good example. Are you talking about like, for example, in the other like the third world growth rates compared to California? I would say like a good example for like a poor planning as um, housing policy as, a, as a, like a community grows or a good example for that. Very random and general question, but. I don't, I, I'm the victim of my living here. I guess. Well, I, I have some ideas. I, I hesitate to mention them because I could be wrong, so I don't want to embarrass myself. But if you give me a, a email, I will send you, uh, let me do a little research and I'll send you what I think uh, would answer your question. Um, oh, come on, Mike, please feel free to embarrass yourself. That's okay. <laughs> Tony, I do enough of that as it is, I mean. Um, I, I will mention that um, one interesting model uh, I've always appreciated is the Oregon model, which is statewide land use planning. So statewide uh, objective standards, every local government has to provide a plan that goes through a, uh, you know, an analysis of both um, the, the amount of economic development and population to make sure that that's contained within the urban boundary of the city. And once that's approved by the state, there is no more environmental review. So they, they handle the review at the general plan level. Um, and, and if you think about it, that makes a whole lot of sense. If we could move the review from every single project to just looking more globally at a city's plan and say, okay, do they have the right housing mix? You know, have they accommodated for the population that's been projected in that area? Uh, do they have the right transportation? Is the water adequate? I mean, if you can do all that review, and, and it, it does happen, I guess, at a specific plan level, you know, that's sort of um, another example here. But to me, it, moving towards a, um, you know, away from project by project and into a more global um, comprehensive view would be certainly um, a move in the right direction. We have that in the state of California to some extent you know, your general plan EIR, and then you come along three, four, five years later with a development proposal, and if it fits with, within that parameter, then uh, you just sign off and check off the, uh, the form and, and off you go. But there, there are a lot of projects that still have to go through the CEQA process. I think that was a perfect closure. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for participating, and we all love roundabouts.